All right, well, this is take two for this uh, winter finch forecast for 2021 uh, video that we'll be doing. Um, so kind of the story is the forecast got released earlier. There were some issues with it, but everything is back online now, um, except they're working on getting the merch back online, right, Matt? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a shot there, but we're, we're making sure the functionality on it is. Yeah, so the forecast is on, um, so you can go check out the 2021 forecast, and we're here with Matt Young and Tyler Hoare from the Finch Research Network to talk about uh, what the winter finch forecast is, and uh, if we're going to see big numbers of birds or if it's going to be a slower year. Um, so Tyler, how is it looking? Uh, hello, everyone. How is it looking? Depends where you are in North America this year. If you are east of Duluth and Thunder Bay up in Lake Superior and along Michigan, Central Ontario, Southern Canada, through New England, New York, you're going to see finches probably because there's a great amount of food there. If you're west of Lake Superior, there's not a lot of food in the boreal forest, it seems, and the birds there are moving. So a lot have moved, the crossbills have moved eastward. And they're also moving down in the Rocky Mountains and the coastal mountains into the Pacific Northwest. So it all depends where you are, but it's going for the traditional east of the forecast, it is going to be a traditional finch winter in the usual spots. Okay. Um, so just looking at like from the top of the forecast, I know we had a pretty incredible year last year where we had a lot of these birds coming to people's feeders and places they wouldn't normally go. So we're not going to see that huge southern movement like we did last year right no last year we had a huge food failure in a huge swath of north america so the, yeah the birds all basically left canada and when they went south they weren't finding the food they wanted so yeah they were on the feeders yeah so, so this year they'll be, they'll be around this year in the traditional areas but you probably have to go into the woods to find them half the time Gotcha. So it's going to be more of a search, especially in like the Midwest, if you want to see these species. Yeah. yeah the Midwest seems... is the wild card in the Midwest is where the birds that are coming out of the West. If they go north of Lake Superior, they're going to head to the east in North mm -hmm. America. If they hit Lake Superior, just north of Duluth, they're going to, they don't want to cross the water if they can avoid it. They're going to come down into the mid upper Midwest. Okay. So a little bit of uncertainty where it might be, might be some different areas where they're going yeah. then. Okay, cool. And then uh, I also wanted to talk about how extreme weather played a role in the forecast this year too. Well, we had, everyone heard in the media about the California wildfires and that. In Canada, we had, in my province alone, we had over 1,100 forest fires. And British Columbia had another 1,400. We most of Western Central Canada had massive fires. People in Eastern North America were complaining about smoke sometimes in the sky and smelling it. That were the fire, yeah, Canadian yeah. fires. Yeah, those are the fires from us. Wow. And between that and a lot of the prairie area provinces and states, they were having a very bad drought, which affected the into the boreal forest. And then we had temperatures we have never seen before. One town in British Columbia set a record, all-time Canadian record. Next day, it broke it with 49.5 Celsius, which is 121 degrees Celsius. Wow. And then the next day, the town was incinerated by a forest fire. Oh, geez. And friends of mine who are working up... 121 degrees Fahrenheit, it? 121 Fahrenheit is what huh. I got to. Friends of mine who are working on the north edge of the boreal forest in the tree line up there were getting temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit up there, which is unheard of. So the cone crop basically didn't form, the trees are stressed, and what berry crops formed, a lot of them failed after they flowered because of the drought. But then you have mountain ash, which is like the wild card. In some areas, the mountain ash, what's the Lake Superior, is great. In other spots, it doesn't exist. Hmm. Um, so I know a lot of people were curious about when the forecast comes out, you have all this data on the crops and everything. So mm -hmm. how do you, how do you gather all that data? I have a, I inherited from Ron Pittaway, a, a roster of people who go out and in their areas and look at the cones. Ron Pittaway had a list of several tree species, deciduous and conifers to look at and some shrubs. 
and a rating system. Mm. So you take that rating system. I have the usual people in late July, early August, I send them the, the email to remind them, hey, can you send this before September? In each the last couple of years since I took over, I'll, I'll put out requests for new people if they want to come in and do this. And I got four new people from Canadian Maritimes coming in, a couple more people from the Midwest. So it helps add to it. So they go out, they look at it, they send in the data or they get tardy and I have to chase them around with emails of 10 days ago, which I hate doing, but you have to, because so, we're all busy at times. And then the information comes in and, and I start consolidating it by species and geographic area and to try to get a picture of what's happening. That's awesome. So it's all volunteer based then, huh? All volunteer based, yes. Very cool. We do have some professional foresters who will give me what they see for work, but mostly it's just volunteers, naturalists, bird watchers, forest lumberjacks. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so what about individual species? Anything unique about what individual species may be doing this year? Uh, in the east, don't expect pine grow speaks or really mm. bohemian wax beans because the mountain ash crop in the boreal and on the edge of the boreal from the Atlantic coast to Lake Superior area, area is very heavy. It's, I don't even think they're going to move much because they have so much food there. Usually the bears and the, the swings and thrushes by September when I go up there have got into these berries pretty heavily. They hadn't even been touched yet. Hmm. So, but west of Lake Superior, it's, as I said, it, mountain ash, some spots, they have excellent crops. Other spots, they have nothing, a lot of crops just about an hour west of Lake Superior, north of northern Michigan, I mean, sorry, north of northern Minnesota. The, their fruit crop basically dried up during the drought. So pine grow speaks there, will probably, they'll be looking at towns, what they can, they'll be moving around trying to find crops. And I expect a bunch of them to actually move south into northern Minnesota okay. looking for food. Interesting. Um, we also did have a couple questions that I wanted to ask as well from uh, viewers. And so this is for um, Matt or Tyler and Matt. I think there will be many red crossbills and white wing crossbills late this year on the western half of the U.S. I haven't seen any in what feels like ages. Also, do you think common red poles are even going to venture down this year? The drought in the west West Lake Superior West. Like Lake Superior this year is the pinnacle. Everything goes, pivots off either side of Lake Superior. Uh, I expect some West of Superior, some red pole movement as they're trying to find, because the birch crop, which is a heavy source for them, the birch and other deciduous trees are having a really bad time with the drought. I, mean, I was getting reports that they were already turning, leaves are turning brown already in August. So I'm thinking west of Superior, I see more red poles starting to come out of the forest, the weedy fields and all that, and maybe down further into the mountains in the west. White wing crossbills, they already did a move out of western Canada, down the mountains in the southwest Canada, Pacific Northwest, into the uh, good Doug fir, Douglas fir and western hemlock crop that's there, apparently. And the ones went oh. to the east. I'll let... They're in the Angleman spruce crop down there. I mean, they'll, they'll hit the dub fur in the western hemlock, but they want those, those white wings and reds use spruce um, in the fall more so. Dub fur, though, they'll, they'll hit though somewhat for sure, white wings, but white spruce or Engelman spruce is really what they're all after um, at this time of year, if it's available. So I don't know. I'm assuming that it must be pretty good in the Mountain West because as Tyler said, white wings are in the Pacific states, and they've made it at least to Utah. So, interesting. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, we had another question that I think kind of was already answered as far as the crops and stuff. Um, but Caden wanted to know how you guys know certain species will end up in certain areas, like western birds coming in New England. And... Um, you know, that's basically just based on the crop data and then um, kind of as you talked about Lake Superior where, where stuff is going to kind of be moving at a certain time and then hit and then might disperse, right? Uh, yeah, some species that move, like they, they know where the crop is. Like white wing crossbills, they just move right across one end to the other end of the, of the continent each year. 
depending, I don't know how they smell it and how they know they're there, but they move in midsummer to where the food is. And they'll be moving that way. Other species, it's more, the other movement is survival. They, they will start moving later in the fall when they start moving down from their regular haunts and realize, oh, why you, where I usually winter, there's nothing. So they'll be pushing a lot further. Like last year when the pine siskins and evening grow speaks and basically everyone just went on a, a big run because they weren't finding any food to stop them. Yeah, I mean, at least in Wisconsin, I, I, it was a great year for like winter finches. I remember we had a little flock of evening grosbeaks in Milwaukee and there were pine siskins down there. Red poles were still a little hard to find, but I think everybody really enjoyed the, the year last year. But um, I think that one of the main... I mean, it was the best year since 97, 98 last year. So that's just a given. And as Tyler said, well, evening grosbeak, you said, was probably 40 years, you thought? 40 years since they did that big flight in, in Ontario back in, I think it was 72, we had flights uh, where they're getting close to 2,000 birds on the shoreline of Hawk Watch. It's just pouring through in one day. Wow. They haven't seen that. And this year we had, over my house alone, I broke 100 twice, just watching evening gross beaks coming over in flocks. And then a couple lakeshore sites just east of Detroit, because all the birds get funneled in from the east by Lake Erie and Lake Huron, they funnel all the birds down into the Detroit Toledo area. And they were getting flocks over two two days, about a week apart, they were getting thousand plus birds. Just wow. flocks of hundreds of evening gross beaks in one flock, just moving fast. And uh, like on those years where there's like a super flight, does that, and birds have to go further to find food, does that seem to negatively affect their numbers or anything? Or is, are they just able to adapt by going further south and you know, you don't see any decline in, in species or anything. There's a paper out there on red-breasted nuthatches how they do have a decline mm -hmm. after they have an eruption flight. Interesting. But I'm sure some species, like last year, I'm thinking white wing crossbills in the east that could not find any ornamental cone crops were going mm -hmm. to suffer. Yeah. Because in the east, eastern boreal, it was basically a no-food time. And that's why so, we had... We had boiled chickadees leaving Quebec in good numbers last year. So yeah, even I mean, though this year might kind of be disappointing for people that some species aren't going to move further south, it's probably really good for their numbers that there's a lot of food in the places where they are. So that should help the population for future years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that ongoing bloodworm outbreak, you know, that's, that's going on. And, you know, you kind of have the, the coniferous breeders, the two crossbill species, the siskin, um, which will be breeding to some extent across this kind of southern belt. I think you you agree with me, Tyler, from like Ontario into the Maritimes and into the Adirondacks and across parts of New Hampshire and Vermont and the Maine. But then, you know, there's kind of this little bit of an echo flight with evening grows beaks and but even, like you said, red-breasted nuthatch, maybe even purple finch a little bit, somewhat more tied to that, the budworm outbreaks. So the Northeast will actually be a you know, relatively good year, northeast United mm -hmm. States, southeastern Canada. I think we'll have a, a fairly good year for finches. You, I think we're on the same page with that, right, Tyler? Probably from about Michigan eastward. For evening gross beaks, there's three big outbreaks in Quebec and one big outbreak in northeastern Ontario. If these flocks, especially the northeastern Ontario one, if birds start leaving that area and heading southwest, they may cross into the upper peninsula of Michigan, and then it's, do I go across into Michigan or do I go west to Wisconsin? Oh. Which could be a source. But most of the outbreaks, most of the evening gross beaks in Quebec and Ontario have a belt of food, of cones, maple keys, elm key, seeds and all that, just sitting there waiting for them, which wasn't here last year. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Um, how did, what's the outlook for purple finches this year, too? Because I know last year was a, a lot of people enjoyed seeing purple finches further south. They're, they're moving. Their population is increasing. Like the uh, Bird Observatory in Tadasac had a, a bigger September than they had, August, September than they had last year for purple finches. And uh, one of my observers who's up in northeastern Ontario says they were everywhere. It was, it was ridiculous how many there were in August. Those 
right near the spruce budwing rail break. So they're moving down. We usually have most years in Southern Canada, we lose most of our purple finches. They usually just drip down to the above Kentucky northward when they find food. So this year we're gonna hold some of them with the food, but I can still see there's gonna be a drift still heading south. Okay. But they want I don't I don't anticipate feeder looking at a feeder in South Carolina or Alabama and seeing they have like six or seven of them. Yeah, we had them in Louisiana last year. And I remember just seeing being like, wow, that's crazy to see them at like a bird feeder. Yeah. Um, I was watching these feeder cameras last year because basically other than pine siskins, pretty much everything else just took off out of here in November, October. Yeah. I've been watching I've... these feeder cameras in Alabama. I'm like, you have 20 pine siskins and a <laughs> dozen purple finches. I'm like, I want one. Yeah, Ryan Brady, he lives in Bayfield, Wisconsin, but he had he was always posting what was at his feeder, and it was a ridiculous number of pine gross beaks and evening gross beaks, and just the colors were so beautiful to see all those birds together. Um, Matt, what, the coast. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, what are your thoughts on the forecast this year and, and the predictions? <laughs> well, it's a trickier one, you know, because it's uh, last year we had the super flight, and there usually is a little bit of a biennial pattern to this stuff uh, to some degree. And so trying to figure out, you know, are we going to see an echo flight of some sort? Was there going to be a cone crop that was going to develop? And, you know, where was that going to develop? You know, and then you add on top of that the layers of the wildfires, the drought, you know, the budworm outbreaks. You know, so it makes it a little bit trickier. You know, numbers are still should be a, a bit higher than, you know, they were, you know, four, five, six years ago for like evening rose peaks and purple finches, you know, um, so they're not going to, as Tyler said, you, you know, purple finches might make it to you know, the mountains of North Carolina, but they're not going to be down in the, ever, you know, central Florida. There's not going to be a flock of 20 siskins in the Everglades. There's not going to be evening gross peaks in Orlando, things like that, or white red-breasted nuthatches and pine siskins out on Bermuda. You know stuff like that which was just we did not expect to you know that was kind of unprecedented you know as tyler said 40 years for even gross beasts to, to bomb over us i mean i think a lot of canadians last year they were up i mean all the birds just flooded out of the boreal last year they, did, they, they left the boreal they left the, our border areas of the province they were just gone you'd watch yeah. flock after flock just leaving going come on please someone stop <laughs> i had you more know. siskins when they started moving back up in February than I had before then. And they actually, I actually had Siskin stay here into June and try to nest. That's no. crazy. But yeah. they were not, but the fall was just like saying goodbye to them. So, I mean, between the two of us, I mean, it's like we were on the phone a lot this week or, you know, phone, text, messaging. You know, I think you and I have collectively over 40 years of looking at this stuff or close to that, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that, Tyler? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was 1999 I did the first erupted bird survey for the you know, Cornell lab, and that was bird source back then. So yeah. it's a uh, different time. So. Right, Ron, yeah. a long time ago, Ron got me, Shanghai'd me in to help uh, do, look at trees because I roamed around the boil for work. And uh, like this year, my daughter wanted to go to Thunder Bay, which is 21 hour drive from my house because she wanted to see where daddy works. So I decided to join that together with looking at cones and 3,000 kilometers, what, 17, 1,800 miles later, we went through the boreal forest in Ontario. Yeah, and that's the other thing. I mean, we, didn't, we, we kind of tried to cover it in our first take this morning or this afternoon is, you know, there's still some, there's not people just out driving all across, you know, Canada as, as much as it would, you know, they have in the past for the forecast mm -hmm. with COVID. Right, I think you were mentioning something about that earlier, Tyler, right? Yeah, like a lot of the First Nations didn't want people who didn't live there to come in. And a lot of the researchers who were working up in the boreal forest, the federal government and some of these province, provincial governments said, nope, you can't leave this area to work. We were up here were pretty strict on times when you could go in many areas. Mm hmm Gotcha. And then in the in the forecast, there's also the kind of 
uh, eruptive passerines covered with the Blue Jays, Red-Breasted Nuthatch, mm-hmm. and the Bohemians. Yeah. Um, what are we looking at for those species? Uh, in the east, there's a, there's a little bit of echo flight going on right now across. Can you guys uh, define the echo prairie. flight for the viewers? Uh, echo flight is when you have a big migration of birds one fall, and then the next year there's an echo where there's another flight of, of the same species in smaller numbers, where birds that maybe did not go all the way home go back okay. south in the, in the winter. Um, in the east, some, some birds are heading south of the red the nut hatches, but there's a lot of food there that should hold most. But again, it's the west of Superior, the drought area, up for Wisconsin, Minnesota, maybe in northern Illinois. You could see more red-breasted nut hatches coming down that way. Uh, blue jays, they like a lot of acorns, a lot of soft seed crops, and it won't be a strong flight as it was last year because there's so few food. But some areas up here, we had gypsy moths, which are also what they call the LDD moths now. They defoliated thousands of acres of oak and deciduous forest here, which a lot of, made a lot of oak trees get too stressed to make acorns. So that's an erratic patch. So some areas, there's lots of food for them. Some areas are not. So we're seeing about a moderate flight of them heading south. I don't think they're going to go super far because there's a lot of food in the states below Canada. And the Bohemian, they like to roam around a lot. They love their mountain ash. In the east, they should pretty much stay close to the mountain ash. Out Lake Superior westward, they're going to be moving around in flocks. I can see them in some places show up in towns. I could see flocks hit Superior and head south looking for any mountain ash crops. In towns, they like the ornamental crop, ornamental crab apples, the ornamental mountain ash, and they love European buckthorn. Usually up in northern, north of the Adirondacks in the Canadian New York State area, there's a lot of buckthorn and they show up there. On average years, they'll show up there in late winter. On good years, they're there by December. On a year like this, if they show up there, it might be the odd stray flock before the end of winter. Then you might get something in there in March, April showing up there, just trying to find what berry crop is left after stripping stuff to the north. They're very mobile. Gotcha. Yeah, I, those winter finches and eruptive species are just so fascinating in general. And uh, I think, you know, just by the success of the Finch Research Network, you can tell that a lot of people agree just how cool, you know, those winter finches and eruptive species are. So if I'm interpreting everything correctly, the Northeast should see pretty good numbers of mm-hmm. winter finches. It's not going to be like it was last year where we have huge numbers of things going way south. And then in more like the Midwest, there's some some factors that may make it having more come down or less. We kind of have to see, but probably in that area, you'll have to go into the boreal forest to look yeah. for those, correct? Yeah. Northern Wisconsin, Zach Zimbog could be quite interesting this winter. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, Zach Zimbog is great. Um, well, there cool. There could be you know, one evening growth peaks and some of those pine the western you know, Pacific Northwest pine grows peaks could move into the, you know, border states out west. Um, type one will move around the west, uh, evening grows peak as well. So just so people don't know, there's five different cult types of evening grows peaks out there. So um, well, type one is the only one that really wanders around the west. Okay? Oh, kind okay. of the, so that's the eruptive one out west. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know there's been... Uh some issues with the finch research website but that should be fixed soon so if you guys are having issues finding the forecast there just check on it periodically and it it should be resolved they also have some really cool merch uh finch research network shirts and things like that um they're working on getting the merch type stuff back up but when it is you definitely want to get one because they're super cool and i really love the design the design on those so awesome stuff well um Thanks so much, guys, for for talking with us today. It's really interesting stuff with the uh, eruptive species and everything like that. So, well, thanks for having uh, us. Your time. Yeah, thanks for having us. No doubt. Sure thing. Um, viewers, make sure to subscribe and uh, leave a comment if you guys have any questions about eruptive species or winter finches. Uh, we're always in touch and so on. You know, the next call or hopefully we'll be able to have a live where the internet doesn't shut down on us. But uh, you know, maybe we can do a live live thing or something but uh really excited about uh
the pinch forecast and uh, excited to see how it'll play out in the future. All right, thanks. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks.